The first principle of economics is thou shalt not steal, even if the majority says it's okay to steal. I'm Gary DeMar. Welcome to this edition of Vantage Point. What is the first principle of economics? Some economists will claim that it's supply and demand, while others insist that it's scarcity or the division of labor. But the first principle of economics is thou shalt not steal. The word economics is derived from two Greek words, oikos, meaning house, and namos, meaning law. Combined, we get rules or laws of the house. Economics is ethical before it is pra practical. This follows the older definition of the word economy found in Noah Webster's 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language. Economy, he writes, primarily the management, regulation, and government of a family or the concerns of a household. The use of political economy as a definition does not appear until the 8th and 9th entries, and yet it's the primary definition today. Almost all modern definitions of economics, like contemporary definitions of government, assume that the state, civil government, is the starting point in understanding economic theory and practice. To grasp these, so the argument goes, the role the state plays in economic decision making in the allocation of scarce resources must first be considered. For many, this is a reasonable and moral starting point when uh, resources are scarce and people have needs. On the other side of the economic spectrum, classical liberals, libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, and even some conservatives contend that the means of production should be privately owned. Economic decisions also should be made privately with goods and services exchanged in a free market with little or no active state intervention. The role of civil government in economic matters should be minimal. The protection of, of individual property rights, the enforcement of just weights and measures, and the maintenance of a peaceful a social order so commerce can take place. With the premise that law is foundational for a social order, economic laissez-faire as it is often portrayed by American liberals and international socialists, often one and the same, is not the world of Mad Max beyond Thunderdome where law is arbitrary. Modern economic theory presupposes that markets need to be regulated so there will be a just accounting for everyone. If there is inflation, an increase in the money supply resulting in higher prices, interest rates are raised and existing and future assets are, are diluted in value. If the economy is sluggish, governments will increase the supply of money to stimulate growth. If one segment of society is being left behind economically, taxes will be raised and income redist uh, redistributed to smooth out the inequities in the name of social justice. This, paradigm's, uh, this paradigm assumes complete knowledge of what people want and how much they will pay for it. It also assumes that those who make these decisions are benefactors. They do it for our good, they claim. The advocates of a free market and those who declare for a managed market claim to promote justice with their policies. Again, there is little argument over wanting to establish a just marketplace. The question is, how do we account for justice? What is its source? Mutual consent? public opinion, enlightened self-interest. Those involved in economic transactions believe and hope for an agreed upon set of rules, laws that apply to all equally, especially since we live in an imperfect universe. Like reason and justice, how do we account for the validity of these rules? The Bible begins with two uncontested presuppositions. First, God exists. And second, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. A third presupposition logically follows from the first two. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, Psalm 24, 1. Not only the land, but the stuff of creation also belongs to God. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50, verse 10. Private, that is, personal property rights are based on the fact that God is the prior owner who delegates a derivative ownership to his creation. The creator-creature ownership paradigm is the model for how we establish the principle of private property and the laws that go with it. If I own a piece of property and decide to sell it or give it away, the transaction has legitimacy because I had legal title to the property and I voluntarily decided to part with it. In the same way, God's original ownership makes subsequent ownership possible and meaningful. Without the reality of prior ownership, the idea of private property does not exist. 
The average American has only vague notions of these ideas. While most Americans would agree that stealing is wrong, they don't seem to have a problem if some other entity steals for them. Consider this example. If John has a financial need, would it be right for him to rob his neighbors to supply that need? Most people would say no. Would it be right for John to get some of his friends to steal for him? Again, most people would say no. But what if John convinces enough people to create a civil government that takes money from his neighbors to pay for things John and others need? Now the picture has changed, and I suspect that a lot of people would not call it theft because elected government officials are doing the taking. The free market is, is counterintuitive for many people, especially politicians, many of whom have never owned a business. Passing laws for society and exempting themselves as standard fair in Washington. When Social Security was made law, Congress exempted itself and other government employees by developing their own private retirement programs. This changed in 1983 for new government employees. Congress has been considering an energy bill that will include tax increases on energy consumption. It's being sold as a tax on the oil and gas industries. Nonsense. It's a tax on every user of energy. Corporations have never and never will pay taxes. A tax is an expense to a manufacturer similar to the raw products he must purchase to make what he eventually sells. All expenses, taxes included, are passed on to consumers. In their purest form, taxes were imposed to pay for a service common to everyone, the common defense, as the Constitution says, or to those who actually use a service, gasoline taxes for roads. The gasoline tax is a great example of a non-punitive service tax. The only people who pay it are those who use the roads. If you don't drive, you don't pay the tax. If you take a taxi, you pay it indirectly in the price you pay for the taxi ride because the price you pay includes the cost it takes to run a taxi. One of those costs is gasoline. The same is true when you and I buy something off the internet and it's delivered to our home or office. The fuel costs that were necessary to bring the item to market and shipped are figured in the price. We pay the tax. So the next time that you want the government to do something, keep in mind that it does not have any money. It can only get it by taking it from you and me or printing it. The first method is theft, something that would put us in jail if we did it. The second method is also theft. Printing money lowers the value of the currency that's already in circulation. By inflating the currency, the dollars in our wallets and investment lose value. So never forget the operating premise, thou shalt not steal, even if the majority says it's okay.